I want to thank, first and foremost, the music sector in Sweden for um, giving us the opportunity to share uh, with you uh, a keynote. Uh, I want to take you on a journey around what's happened in UK, in particularly the last 12 months around diversity, the workforce, um, just generally uh, on the back of um, all the issues and um, just, you know, some of the systems that we could really look at. So um, I'm Amo Tawa, uh, I'm the CEO of Punch Records. I'm also uh, the chairman of UK Music Diversity Task Force. And this is 30 minutes, hopefully, of fun, um, but also quite some serious stuff that we're involved in. Um, so a little bit about myself before I get into the, the, the real detailed work. Um, I, was, I grew up in Birmingham. It's the second city in the UK, uh, in England. Uh, it's 1.1 million people. Um, we're 44% non-white British. So we're really moving to probably perhaps England's first plural city. Uh, we're Europe's youngest city. And uh, in my heyday, I, I studied civil engineering, um, but actually I, I saw what my brother was doing in the music industry. He was a manager for an artist called Apache Indian years and years ago. God, we're going back. And uh, I really liked, I saw him just traveling the world and I said, God, I want to do what you're doing. I didn't have a clue about music, uh, music industry. I didn't even know there was jobs in the music industry. Uh, so as a good Indian boy, I opened up a shop. Um, it wasn't a corner shop. It was a record store. And, and on the top left, you can see me. That's me uh, trying to sell records. So I thought I'd end up um, going grey and selling Northern Soul. Uh, as a miserable old Punjabi, uh, but obviously things changed. But even as a record store, we had diversity at the core of what we were doing, uh, not because we cared, not because we wanted to. Actually, it was a fin financial imperative. Uh, we were promoters. Uh, we were educators. We did a lot of work in schools. Uh, we were managers of artists. We actually ran a small label. Uh, and, and the key was we also did loads of events. But Napster and LimeWire come, came in and things changed and the shop closed and the company has evolved. And we do three things now. We tour artists. Uh, we, I run a festival and uh, I do all sorts of work around uh, emerging artists. But whilst also um, working as the CEO of Punch, I'm also the chairman of UK Music's Diversity Task Force. Now, UK Music is a relatively... Uh, I wouldn't say an unknown company primarily because uh, uh, the history was quite interesting. You have a number of trade bodies in the UK that represent their members. People like, say, the BPI, who represent large labels and small labels, the Musicians' Union, who represent artists, uh, collective um, management organisations. They call them CMOs, uh, PPL and PRS, who collect royalties on behalf of musicians and songwriters and a whole plethora of um, new, interesting trade bodies. And these trade bodies were talking to government um, individually. And, and around 10 years ago, uh, government said, look, you know, there's just too much noise here. We need you to have one voice. And so all these complex trade bodies who have varying amounts of members, and some of these businesses turn over by themselves over 300 million pounds, all the way through to smaller companies that turn over 100,000 with two staff and five volunteers. Um, they came together in a collegiate, uh, complex process to create UK Music. And I'm the chairman of their task force for diversity, which ultimately means I have a privileged position in terms of I sit around the table with all the CEOs and the chairman of all these trade bodies to look at diversity and the workforce. And obviously it's become a really big thing uh, uh, generally in most countries, but in particularly uh, on the back of what's happened uh, last year. Uh, a little bit about the UK, uh, our music industry is a growth industry. Um, um, we, we turn over, you know, we, we're almost six billion pound to the UK economy and we have around 200,000 jobs. And obviously it's been affected by COVID, but this was a report that was done by UK Music. Um, 
uh, last year looking at the industry and looking at the growth. And you can really get into the granular details of exactly where this industry is quite heavy and where it really makes money and where it really looks at trade. And again, all these facts and figures are there on the UK Music Report. I think what's really important also is what we've done uh, in England is we've, 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 we've taken a thematic approach around uh, how we see the music industry um, and we've, we've broken them down into various component parts, music creators, live music, publishing, recorded, uh, representation and retail, including DSPs. And in each uh, thematic group, you can see it's hugely complex. So just with live, you have agents, promoters, festival organisers, production companies, ticket uh, associations. So, so the total ecosystem is quite complex and, and it's really important for I, I suppose governments uh, um, in the UK but across the globe to really understand what our music industry is worth and, and I'm, I have this really interesting job where uh, we, we're trying to look at uh, diversity within the workforce uh, we know representation on the stage it is relatively good uh, but we want to make the workforce more reflective of the society and the audiences we serve. So if you look at London, Birmingham, Manchester, the three big cities in the UK, they're all over 40% non-white British. So our workforce, uh, the dynamics um, and the success uh, and, and the growth of most companies will hopefully be on the diversity and discourse of who's actually working. But actually sometimes diversity doesn't work. And there are many reasons why it doesn't work. Uh, and, and here I've listed a few, you know, and sometimes organizations don't care, leaders aren't truly invested. Often it's left to one person or a group of people. Uh, people think it's other people's problems. There's no budget. I'm, I'm sure there's, I'm sure you can see uh, uh, that there's a plethora of reasons why perhaps it doesn't. But we want to talk a little bit about what we've done. Uh, in the UK. So uh, before I look at, you know, the report that we put out and the action plan that we've co-designed and collaborated with the music industry, let's just look back at last year. It, you know, it was hugely complex. We had this thing called Brexit. We obviously, you know, in March, uh, COVID landed, which had a profound effect on the music industry. And then the murder of George Floyd, which um, ricocheted globally. Um, this ultimately created uprisings in multiple cities across the US. I'm not sure what the, um, how it trickled down in terms of its effect and impact in Sweden, but in the UK, um, uh, UK Black Lives Matter started to really galvanise and it felt different primarily because it was, it felt modern, it felt diverse, it felt more reflective of the society we live in. And, um, you know, in June, there was a thing called Blackout Tuesday, which basically meant every single major, well, every single company in the music industry just took a day out to reflect on what they are doing around diversity. Uh, you know, how are they impacting? How are they talking to their diverse staff? What's actually going on? And, you know, one of the first big things that happened was, um, you know, in America, Drake's and Ariana Grande's label, Republic said, we're going to get rid of the word urban and we're going to start using black. Um, in, <clears throat> in, in the UK, it wasn't just about music. Uh, you know, it was more than that. It was about looking at our history. And, and, and this is Edward Colston, uh, uh, quite a quite famous uh, um, slave owner, um, uh, uh, and its statue in Bristol being dismantled. And I know every single country has its own historical issues to deal with around its connection and, and role in imperialism. I'm sure Sweden has uh, many statues that people want to, uh, you know, dismantle. I'm for holding on to history and putting these things into museums rather than just chucking them into rivers. But that's my personal opinion. And we had, uh, you know, the, the Chancellor who had put together a fiscal package it was a fiscal intervention that was the biggest ever known to England. And record labels reacted 
quite well. They all the three big majors put together uh, justice funds: uh, Sony's, Warner's, and Universal. Uh, primarily coming from America, said, "Look, we, we really need to do something about this. We really need to look at it from a global perspective, but we need to look at each particular country and area, and diversity, equity, inclusion, justice." All these things, uh, they ricochet into every single boardroom. That's Lucian Grange, the global CEO of Universal Records. Um, and words became, uncomfortable words became normal. So, you know, phrases like white privilege. And, and, and I prefer to talk about gender privilege and place privilege before I talk about white privilege, because actually... I'm not sure whether everybody really understands what white privilege is. It's not about rich, middle-aged, white, European, heterosexual men. It's actually about the absence of having to live with the consequences of racism. And those who don't necessarily understand what white privilege is, I want you to just spend 10 seconds looking at this picture. And this picture pretty much says, it says a lot about not just privilege, but also entitlement. Systemic racism became a normal uh, a phrase, again, within the music industry. And again, there's four layers to systemic racism. Uh, the institutional, the structural, the interpersonal, and, and the unconscious. And these four layers are hugely, hugely complex. Um, I don't have time to go into every single particular part of systemic racism, but I think um, we can talk about this perhaps later uh, in the debates. These are hugely complex areas and we have to all really get to grips with what, what do we mean when we say systemic racism? Ultimately, it's about systems change. And companies can you know, do things. Uh, for us, unconscious bias is the first stage of dealing with systemic racism or systemic issues. But for us and myself in particular, I think uh, this is like a spring clean. You've got to do it two or three times a year just to get a sense of what's going on. So anyway, during all this um, uh, madness, uh, we had to put together a survey and a report, and that's us, the task force. And it com it's a combination of many people from the trade bodies, uh, different labels. So I can see Universal in there, I can see Warner's in there, I can see Sony in there. Uh, uh, just looking and saying, what are we gonna do around diversity? Um, we put together uh, a survey and obviously it did really, really well, uh, primarily because it was 2020. Uh, but, you know, we really wanted to get to grips with what equality meant, what equity meant and how we all felt about justice. And I love this diagram because it really gives you a sense of what we're talking about. Um, obviously during the middle to latter part of last year, uh, the, the BLM movement globally was uh, phenomenal. And it, for us, it was about explaining that Black Lives Matter, all lives matter, but right at this moment in time, Black Lives Matter. Uh, and and um, this diagram says a lot about what's going on in terms of the influence of uh, all the campaigning that took place. And in the UK, um, in particular, we have a phrase in government called BAME, which is an acronym for Black Asian Minority Ethnic, which for most uh, diverse communities, it's a lazy term uh, and it, it's a government term and, and it's a, uh, it, it covers everything from, you know, so the black in the B would be anything from Ethiopian through to Jamaican. The A could mean anything from Chinese to uh, Pakistani and the minority ethnic. Well, you know, in the UK, some of our cities, they're going to be majority ethnic. So, you know, we wanted to really look at dismantling some language that was a little bit dated. So we did the survey, loads and loads of people really got to grips with what was going on. And then we started looking at the data. Uh, and the data is really, really interesting. Um, uh, and with the data, we, we, we had some roundtables because there's no point in putting out reports just with data. It has to have a, a combination of data, some uh, roundtables and lived experience. And then we triangulated 
this information. And you can see all the data, you know, so we're, you know, in terms of gender representation, it's not too bad. We're working towards 50-50. Ethnic representation, it looks good at 22.5%, uh, but um, actually in some cities, as I said, it's, we're 45%. But nationally, in the UK, in England, we're 14%. So we can really uh, play around with the data. And that's what we're going to do this year. We're going to start unleashing all sorts of data. This, this just gives you ethnic and gender representation. We have disability, LGBTQ, and all the protected characteristics. But what's interesting is, if you look at that 22.5% ethnic minorities that work in the music industry, what we want to do is actually break it down even more and really look at, well, what do we mean when we say ethnic minority? Because historically, in the music industry, the Black or Black British was the major player in the minority breakdown. And as you can see in 2020, it's moved. It's shifted phenomenally. Actually, mixed Mixed race or dual heritage is the biggest component part and biggest community within the breakdown of ethnic minorities. So you can see even diversity is complex and the diversity within the diversity, it's really important to understand. And the data tells us stuff that we've, we kind of knew, you know, uh, if you look at ethnic minorities and age, it starts really good at the bottom, 16 to 24 year olds. And then it gets, you know, it gets, it, it tapers into the older you get. Uh, it's the same with gender and age. So you, you look at, you know, women uh, coming into the music industry, it's around 66%. Um, by the time people are 45, it's 35. It's virtually, uh, you know, nearly half. There's a problem. What is that problem? We need to identify the problem. Is it about policies in record labels? Is it about uh, families? Is it about, you know, uh, the work environment? We need to look at the blocks. It's the same with, um, ethnicity in Korea, you can see right at the bottom, it, you know, it's around 42% uh, uh, for minority communities. And when it gets to the top, it's virtually half. So most of this data is pretty much telling us diverse communities are, and women, uh, you know, they come into the music industry and they don't necessarily move to the top. There's a block. And in 2020, we did the first uh, disparity of ethnicity and gender around income. And this is quite stark. Uh, if you're of minority communities, you're going to get paid less. If you're a woman, you're going to get paid less. If you're a black woman, it's a double whammy, unfortunately. So ultimately, we did, we had all this data, uh, as I said, and we had all this lived experience, but there's no point in putting out reports if you're not going to do anything about it. So we put together by using the data and by co designing it with. The, the trade bodies, we put together an action plan. And the action plan is something that we developed, as I said, with everybody. So we didn't bash people over the heads with diversity saying, oh, you're wrong. Uh, we really looked at what can we do together? And this is quite complex. And I want to spend a little bit of time explaining this. We worked with companies that turn over 300 million pound all the way through to small companies that have one staff and five volunteers. And so we wanted a plan and an action plan that was smart, respectful, but ultimately moved and, and shifted the dial. So some, you know, low hanging fruit, we got rid of the, the term urban, you're not allowed to use it in any of the reporting in the music industry now in the UK, uh, stop using the word uh, BAME, uh, 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 and, and use, you know, be comfortable and okay about saying black or Asian. Um, we also want to know who is accountable and responsible for diversity across the organisation, because there's a massive difference between accountability and responsibility. Um, we want for us to shift the dial. We want people to start looking at recruitment methods and uh, ensuring that there's a uh, there's a budget for recruiting diverse people. And if you're a small organisation, you share that responsibility with other organisations. Uh, you also want to make sure that there's uh, a CPD programs. What that means is continued professional development. So if we know there's a block in particularly with diverse communities in the middle, we need to know that uh, organizations, trade bodies, record labels, the music industry as a whole is really looking at making sure that people have that development opportunity. And, and also to 
really, you know, let's let's set some targets and some timelines around uh, really getting to grips with representation in the middle. Um, these these action plans were not just pulled out of thin air or a cloud. They everything was driven by the data, and everything was driven by um, primarily all the conversations we were having. We also want better transparency around uh, gender and uh, uh, ethnic pay gap and move towards a lower reporting rate. What that means is everybody should report their, uh, their, their pay difference. And, it, uh, and in the UK, we're moving more towards that. It's obvious the companies that pay their men, you know, some companies pay their men 40% more so than their women. That's just not normal and acceptable. And actually, um, it's... It, it, it's not good for the bottom line, and I'll explain why later. Um, if you, as an organisation, um, often uh, we all have our own echo chambers, and if you, as an organisation, you, you you struggle to deal with minority communities or uh, LGBT or disability or, uh, um, you know, any of the particular characteristics, well, go and work with an organisation that's... Go and work with a charity and learn from that charity. Um, this is all about policies. This is all about setting internal diversity targets uh, within uh, not just their own tra trade bodies, but also looking at their own supply chain. Uh, and we, we, this is a strategic plan. So we're not looking about, we're looking at differences in one year, two year, but we're looking at the, the arch, which is, you know, five to 10 years. So we want better data uh, uh, for better reports for better intervention for years to come. And then some metrics around uh, race and gender for governance, because we want to ensure that diverse people are at the heart of decision-making. And you can see, you know, people say, well, why do you want to do this? Well, it's just better for the bottom line. You know, the, the, the McKinsey report explicitly says that, you know, if you have more women and more diverse people in your company, it's better for the bottom line. And that kind of correlates also to the music industry. So, you know, you may say, well, there's loads of issues that I have. Well, I wanted to share quickly with you some really interesting, diverse companies that are doing really, really well. Black Butter, Relentless, Since 93, and Young Turks, four independent labels doing some magical work. And you can see by just the artists that, they work with, they're all diverse. They're all reflective of modern day England and they're all doing pretty well. And, uh, you know, they pretty much bring in the books. Now, I know that in not just the UK, but in Sweden, you know, you have independent platforms that are doing some pretty amazing work. Uh, Ditto, uh, Amuse, TuneCore. And these, some of these companies are, you know, local, some of them are global. Um, but I, I really think this is the, f you know, this is one part of the future of really amplifying uh, sounds that are coming out of Sweden and, and, and the UK. Um, I just did a little bit of digging and, and, and I found this really interesting uh, chart around streaming um, from Swedish artists uh, and just looking at you know you're exporting uh, the export figures are larger than domestic figures um, you know so having a diverse portfolio of artists how do you get that you probably get that through having a diverse workforce how do you get that by looking at what does Sweden look like and what will it look like in the next 10 years? Because things are going to change. Your cities are evolving like our cities. Uh, uh, I've been to Stockholm uh, a few times, but I know Malmo is very, very diverse in terms of not just uh, its independent artists, but its workforce and its citizens. So we, we, we as people who work in the music industry who can make decisions, um, we have, I wouldn't say a civic responsibility. I said, look, if we want to be relevant and we really want to push the agenda, uh, we, we really need to look ourselves. And this, this, um, this keynote for me was just about sharing a journey 
in terms of what's happened in the UK in the last 12 months. We had a unprecedented year with not just COVID having a major effect on the music industry, pretty much knocking out 90 nearly 95% of the live sector. Um, we had the uprising uh, with Black Lives Matter. We had uh, people working from home. Uh, so it, these are major, major tectonic shifts in how we collectively work as an industry. And we have to learn, and it, it cannot be in 21, when hopefully the pandemic tapers out. It cannot be business as usual. We have to look at different ways of working. Uh, there's going to be less money. There's going to be less. Um, there'll be a bit of a shift of skills. We've lost colleagues who are experts in the music industry already. So we want to, you know, we want that those skills back. We want those teams uh, those production teams, those uh, technicians, those people that really are at the heart of our music industry. But also we mustn't lose track of um, uh, the diversity and the future of our countries. And this last um, slide is just something that I think we can all think about in terms of if we're going to shift the dial, you know, the first thing that you've got to ask yourself is, do you really want to? Because if you don't, then this slide isn't for you. If you do, and most people do want to shift the dial, they want, you know, they want different opinions. Uh, they want different models. Um, uh, this, this slide just gives you a sense of what you can do. So, uh, again, it's all the things that I've been saying, uh, you know, spend some time around in, uh, looking at diversity in different ways. Um, uh, put together some strategies, collect some data. Data is really important, primarily because government agencies, no one can complain, because often what happens is if minority communities say, oh, we're not getting through the door, they'll just go, well, where's your evidence? The data gives you the evidence. We have the evidence in the UK. Look at governance. So really look at your board and look at your exec and say, well, how reflective and diverse are we? The world is unfortunately going to change uh, and the music industry will change and, and we need to, the music industry can be leaders around the change. Um, you know, implement some of these diverse practices, uh, uh, express a commitment to diversity, uh, make those accountable, uh, accountable uh, uh, and be confident and collaborate. You don't have to know everything about diversity to do magical things and uh, I'm a firm believer in the you know the environmental uh, nudge nudge nurture concept so we need to nudge people nurture people and then nudge people uh, and I think uh, that's what we should do in diversity and diversity practice so hopefully I've given you a bit of an insight in terms of uh, what we've been working on in the UK all of this information is available on uh, UK Music's uh, website, ukmusic.org, and uh, hopefully uh, you've taken you on a bit of a journey, and uh, hopefully you've enjoyed it. I'm open for questions, and thank you once again for having us.